Good evening and welcome to tonight's event. My name is Eve Castle, National Business Development Manager at Brickworks. And whether you are joining us here in Sydney or anywhere across Australia, thank you for tuning in. In the spirit of reconciliation, Brickworks acknowledges the traditional owners of the lands on which we are gathered and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our deepest respects to elders, past, present and emerging. At Brickworks, we aim to provide a platform for sharing ideas and discussions surrounding architecture and design. Throughout the year, we will continue to bring you diverse events online as well as in person hosted in our design studios throughout Australia and North America. We are very pleased to welcome Morris Ajmi, who has been generous in taking time out of his office in New York to embark on a Brickworks Australia design studio tour. Our long-term collaborator, Stephen Barrity, who is an architect, writer, and educator, will be hosting the event tonight to guide the conversation. And our sincerest thanks go to both Morris and Stephen for their time and for making this event possible. In addition to events like this, our content collaborations are just one way we show our industry support as a way of celebrating the great outcomes that occur when the materials we make are in the hands of expert designers and builders. So just before this in detail international event gets underway, I'd like to share our latest collaboration with The Local Project, which features the unparalleled Casa Mia, the exceptional home of Caroline da Costa and Adrian Idell in Perth, Western Australia. Please enjoy and thank you again for joining us. This house really does for us personally reveal how design can radically change the way in which we interact. And it can change, in a way, our thoughts about what architecture can possibly do, improving behaviour and health. I'm most proud of the livability of the house and the way that we have been able to introduce lots of different textures and materiality. The brickwork's really important to us because that stitches together the entire spatial composition of the house. Brickworks were just very open-minded. They were always assisting us in making that become a reality. It's demonstrating how one can have that higher density form of living, creating those opportunities for how we might engage with each other and engage with our natural environment. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back for our first live international speaker since COVID pushed us online. It's been quite a while, but it looks like we have a great turnout for tonight's speaker, Morris Ajmi. Morris Ajmi studied architecture at Tulane University in New Orleans in the USA. He established his practice MA in 1997, following a 13 year collaboration with Pritzker Prize winning architect Aldo Rossi. With 10 of those from 1987 to 97, as a partner. I'm sure Morris has included some stories of that time in his presentation. On that strong foundation, Morris built a design practice dedicated to interpreting the historic forces that shape cities, to create buildings and environments that are both contextual and contemporary, something that I imagine is sometimes a tough battle in a place like New York. Today, his work is known for its thoughtful engagement with history, distinct interpretation of industrial forms, creative use of materials and technologies, including some very special work with bricks, sophisticated sustainable designs and thoughtful engagement with the arts. Morris Ajmi's integration of tradition and innovation has yielded a body of work that is sometimes subtle, often bold, and always deeply imbued with a sense of place and purpose. Thus, the work of MA has become a favorite of both forward-thinking developers and history-minded preservationists. Morris's passion for historic and industrial architecture was formed by the cast-iron French Quarter balconies and crumbling Creole cottages in his hometown of New Orleans, and refined during his time with Aldo Rossi, now developed even further with the work of MA. The firm's collaborative studio environment and breadth of internal resources are key to its success. With a combined staff of nearly 100 in New York City and New Orleans, MA has designed over 2.5 million square metres of built space in more than 25 cities 
throughout the United States and abroad. Morris has flown here all the way from New York and he's ready to engage with our Australian Brickworks audience. Please give a warm welcome to Morris Ajmi. Good evening. Thanks for the kind words, Stephen. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I want to thank everybody at Brickworks and um, special thanks to Brett, Eve, and Laura, um, who I met in uh, New York, and we start, started talking about this in March, um, and I'm here. So <laughs> um, I also want to thank Katie and Brooke, who uh, welcomed me this uh, afternoon when I came by to see the space, and um, a special shout out to Chris Taylor and Harlan Redgren, who are, Harlan's here tonight, um, and I sort of came here to convince him to come back to New York to work with me. Um, uh, and I think I might have, yeah, I'm getting close. Um, anyway, um, the talk tonight uh, entitled A Grid in a Conversation is also the title of a book that celebrates 20 years of, of, of my office's work. Um, and it came from a comment by a, a colleague and friend who said that every one of our buildings starts with a grid and a conversation. And that conversation is with history, it's with context, and um, I really want to um, take you through some of the projects and also start with just telling you where I came from. Um, one thing I do want to uh, point out is that using history and context as a way to inform our work doesn't limit what we do. I think it really opens up the possibilities, and if we have a blank canvas or if I have a blank canvas, I have much more difficulty coming up with an idea and working through the project than if I'm responding to the context. And I think that response can happen in a lot of different ways, and hopefully I'll be able to share that with you today. Um, as Stephen said, uh, we have offices in New York and New Orleans. We have about 100 people in the office, um, millions of square feet of built space, and projects um, all over the world. Um, a couple of fun facts. Um, we've had about 10 Australians in the office, and they've all been incredibly talented, and um, that's why I'm trying to convince some of them to come back. Um, also, uh, we have 65 projects with bricks in them, um, and I did some voodoo uh, calculations, and I think we have about 10 million bricks total that we've worked with. Um, one of the projects that we recently finished in New York in Dumbo uh, used about uh, 1.2 million, Laura's going to confirm that for me, uh, of Brickworks as bricks. Um, through Glengarry, which is a company that we've been working with for a long time, uh, that was recently uh, acquired um, by Brickworks. So just a little bit, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the firm, a little bit about where I came from, and then I'll take you through some um, case studies. So um, on the upper left uh, is a residential building in New York. Um, which sort of channeled neo-Gothic architecture, which was uh, present in the surrounding neighborhood. But the idea was really to kind of create a building with a distinctive crown that related to a lot of the other buildings that you can see, like the Chrysler um, or the Empire State Building. Um, so uh, these are sort of typical um, of the typologies that we work in. So on the upper left, residential, um, going clockwork around the screen. On the right is an office building. Um, in between um, the meatpacking and um, West Village, so it used uh, inspiration from both of those and combined those into one uh, sort of uh, aesthetic. And then a project in Boston, which is a master planning uh, using a number of different technologies and uh, this, we're using heavy timber uh, in that building that you see there. And then uh, on the bottom left is a project in Williamsburg, excuse me, the White Hotel, um, which is an adaptive reuse of, um, it was a cooperage. Um, and then just the core practices, we started with architecture in 97 and added interior design um, about uh, 10 years ago. And then we've, as an extension of the architectural practice, we're doing a lot of placemaking um, and master planning. And then art services is something that grew out of a program that we had in the office for art exhibitions. And now we're specifying art for our projects, both on the interior and the exterior. And this is a welcome sign 
uh, which replaced uh, a sign that said Watchtower. It was a Jehovah's Witness building. Um, but just the idea to create some uh, connection between the community and the projects that we're working on. So where do we start? Um, I'm going to focus on um, sort of the, the three areas that inspired my point of view and the way that I work um, on architecture. Um, I was born and grew up in New Orleans. Um, many of you probably know New Orleans through the music, jazz, and Dixieland music, or the food. Um, and certainly the architecture is, is distinctive. Um, I think this is where I became fascinated with the grid. Um, this is a, uh, an image, an early uh, print of New Orleans um, as found by the, the French and later um, really um, uh, populated by the Spanish and then the, Amer the English or Americans came. Um, but you can see the grid is present in the city and um, really helped to organize the way the block structure um, and the buildings on those blocks um, worked. But beyond that, you see the grid in the buildings themselves. Um, and so um, I, wanted, I became fascinated at an early age. Uh, I was eight um, when we went on a, a class trip to the French Quarter, and we, could, we were asked to draw anything we wanted. And I was absolutely fascinated by the grill work and was drawing the patterns and the columns, and the teacher um, encouraged me to study the orders of um, architecture. Um, and that really stuck with me until um, I went to college to study architecture, where I really started to look at this idea of families or um, groups of uh, buildings as types. And this is a typical New Orleans typology. It's called the shotgun. Uh, and they got their name from the idea that you could shoot a shotgun from the front door and it could exit the back without hitting anything. Um, but it's curious because you see these buildings in urban settings, you see them in rural settings, um, most likely uh, came from Africa. Um, but the buildings, and you can see on the left is a two-bay shotgun, and those were really room to room to room. Uh, and on the right is a three-bay shotgun, which typically had a hallway running down the side with the rooms that fed off of that. They're very different, and I'll explain that in a second. And then in the center is a four bay, uh, two, it's two, it's a double, and two two bay shotguns put together. Um, and so I really started to um, look at these different housing types, and for my thesis did a, um, uh, a project on domestic architecture from 1718 when the city was uh, founded until 1865, the end of the Civil War, when things really changed in the city. But as you can see here, I started to look at the things that made these buildings what they were and transcended just the stylistic um, moldings or details and really tried to understand how the plans worked and how the different buildings related to each other. Um, and so what I found was that there were two different um, groups. The Creole types, which were the both Spanish and French uh, buildings, which had this room-to-room -room organization, and the American types, which were inspired by the English architecture, which had the hallway. And so you would see that exist in all of the different types. So a plantation house could ha have, uh, uh, you know, just circulation through the rooms, or it could have a center hall just as a cottage, a townhouse, or a shotgun. And so I really became fascinated with uh, typology and how these types could inform the way that we designed, not just appropriating the sign or the symbol or the decor decorative elements, but really understanding how they worked and how that could inform our process. Um, which brings me to Brian Eno, and most of you are familiar with um, his work um, either in Roxy Music or as a producer of bands like U2 or Talking Heads or David Bowie. Um, but he's also the father of ambient music. And uh, this piece really informed uh, the way that I started to think about architecture. Um, so he took the Canon in D major by Paco Bell and through a series of, and he's the diagram on the lower right, um, tape uh, loops really use that to create a new composition or new music. And there were three variations that he did. Um, and 
why that was important for me and what happened and the way that he sort of created this was um, he had, was involved in a, um, a car accident and he was laid up in bed. A friend of his, Judy Nylon, love that name by the way, um, brought him a, 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 an album of harp music and he put it on, or she put it on the turntable and he realized after it started and she left that it was too low to really hear completely and it would go in and out of his consciousness um, and also um, only was coming out of one speaker. So he wanted to try and get up but didn't get up. And so then he started to think about music that, and a, he, he quotes um, Eric Satie, music that could combine with the, the sound of knives and forks at a dinner party. And so that sort of resonated with me, this idea that architecture could fade into the background or it could become more um, prominent and you could really embrace it and appreciate it in different ways. Um, and then the other thing that was really important about this uh, piece of music was the idea that it related to a historic composition, but it was a new piece and it was modern and he used modern techniques to create it. So those are the kind of things that informed the way I like to think about architecture. And then the next and probably most important thing that changed my um, view of architecture and my course in, um, uh, as an architect was meeting Aldo Rossi. I studied with him at the Institute for Architecture and Urban Study, Studies in New York. Um, as Stephen mentioned, he was the Pritzker, first Italian to win the Pritzker Prize, but he was also a Renaissance person. He was a theoretician first, I think an architect, uh, a painter, and an architect. Uh, at the same time. Um, and um, that experience really helped me um, sort of crystallize the way that I look at architect architecture and provided a foundation for um, the work that I do today. Um, and I was familiar with his work, the Gallertese housing project in Milan and the cemetery in Modena. But this piece um, or this uh, work um, sort of is the one that really attracted me to his, um, uh, yeah, to, to studying with him. And it was a, the Teatro Mondo, uh, was at the Venice Biennale in 1979 and 80. Um, and the thing that I really loved about this building was it was fresh, it was happy, um, it was new, um, but it also related to the city of Venice in a way um, that felt comfortable and seamless with this historic architecture. And I think one thing that's really interesting, if you look at this uh, image and you look at this image, which is uh, a 16th century print, you see a very similar uh, theater sort of parked in the Laguna. And so again, you see history repeating itself in a modern form and being able to relate and have uh, a connection, uh, also important. Um, and then these are just uh, photographs and drawings of um, the theater. And I love the idea of these platonic primal forms that can come together and be potent in their stripped down and modern um, sense. Um, and then after, I actually met Aldo at the Institute and I ended up working in uh, Milan uh, during a summer, I thought I was going to stay for three weeks, and I ended up staying for three years. Um, we won, the, uh, I was built a model for a competition, we won that competition, then another competition for an opera house in Genoa, and then I just kept staying. Eventually I left, and then he called me back a couple of years later when he wanted to open the office in New York, and this was the first project that we did, uh, the Il Palazzo Hotel in Fukuoka, Japan. And I'll say that this is the only project that I've ever worked on that absolutely had no budget. <laughs> Zero. And you'll see there's a gold leaf um, replica of the facade in the bar. Um, the columns on this facade, this is all Iranian travertine. Um, they're 60 centimeters by two meters and they're solid. You know, any other developer would have said, can we figure out a way to you know, skin the columns? Um, but the developer had the foresight to create this antenna building, which really transformed this neighborhood. Um, and Aldo was working on the project in Milan, and he was starting to sketch the facade, and he had liked this idea of, these, um, of a Japanese temple, 
and was starting to assemble the facade. I was looking at the massing and how um, it all would work together. And you can see on the left, there's a building that sort of is, is an angle. And all the buildings in the neighborhood would just follow, they would build to the property line and go straight up to this point where then they had to follow a diagonal um, line. Um, and we decided to pull the building in. Um, Aldo wanted to create something that was really like a, uh, a symbol or a iconic image for the neighborhood. And so um, he came to New York and we were working. Originally the facade was very deep and then every couple of days we'd make it um, flatter and flatter until it was just the columns um, against the uh, travertine facade. Um, there's a detail on the left and um, the gold bar uh, on the right. And when we proposed it, we were almost kidding. And they said, oh, well, we can get the artisans that typically um, apply gold leaf to the Buddhas, and they built this um, you know, out of gold. Um, and that brings me to Scholastic. Um, Aldo died in 97, and then I had four projects left that I sort of shepherded through uh, to construction. Um, and I, this project is really important because it really informed the way that um, I work um, now. I met Bill Higgins, who was uh, the consultant who came up with a grid and a conversation. The project is in Soho, which is a, a historic district, um, primarily uh, made from cast iron in uh, downtown New York. And um, this is one of the first new buildings uh, in Soho. Um, and it had to go through uh, Landmarks um, Preservation Commission to get approval. Um, and so we built a story or a narrative to explain why we did what we did. Um, and um, Soho was built um, out of cast iron for the most part, or masonry, but mostly cast iron. And Badger had a catalog with all of the components. And so all of these buildings, which emulated sort of classical architecture, Italianate in most cases, or many cases, but used the latest technology. At the time, cast iron was a really a new technology and enabled people to build using these components um, and buildings that actually looked like they were masonry, but in fact, they were made out of cast iron. Um, so we looked at the two streets. The building is a, a block through Broadway, which had this monumental character and so we tried to create a facade that recalled those cast iron buildings, but resonated as a monumental facade. Um, and uh, the facade was in steel, aluminum, and glass, fabricated from components that were built off site and then brought onto site. Um, and I think this is the main facade on Broadway, but I think the most popular um, facade is actually on Mercer, which was like the working street. And Aldo used these industrial um, sort of arches as a way to both relate to the cast iron architecture, but also to create something that um, resonated as an industrial um, facade. All right, I'm going to talk about six buildings. Um, most of them are actually all of them, except for one, are in New York. Um, I use the chapters from the book, um, A Grid and a Conversation, but I organize them chronologically and then added one, art and architecture, which is sort of another th thread that runs through the work is this connection to art and an artist that we work with um, uh, before, but in a completely new way. Um, so I'll start with uh, the Samsung building. This is in the Gansworp Market Historic District, also known as Meatpacking District. Um, this building, um, I look at this as sort of two buildings that coexist, not an addition on top. The White Hotel you saw was clearly an addition. Um, this one, I think, has a slightly different um, character in that um, we have an existing uh, building that was deemed contributing by the Landmarks Commission. Um, and there was a previous, um, there were two previous proposals, one to tear the building down, which the Landmarks Commission uh, didn't approve, and then one to extrude it up and build a building on top of it, which they also denied. Um, so the developer called me and said, I want, we just um, acquired this site and we would like to um, you know, build something on top. And I called the landmark, I said, let me call landmarks and see what their appetite is. And um, the person I spoke to said, well, we could see one story on top. And so 
I called, I called the developer. I said, you know, maybe we'll get a story or a story and a half based on, on this conversation. He said, that's absolutely not going to work. We need all the FAR floor area ratio, which is essentially five times the lot. Um, I said, well, I'm, I'm game if you are. It took us a year and a half to get this approved, um, but we were um, successful, obviously. Um, so this, the, this area, the meatpacking district, um, was a posh residential neighborhood. And then the meat packers started to move in and then they started to shave all the buildings. So all, nobody wanted to live above a meat packing plant. So all of these buildings were shaved down to a couple of stories. So the characteristic of the district is very low, but it's kind of uh, industrial and a little funky. So we thought we had the sort of, there was a potential to add more to the building, but we couldn't tear the building down. We couldn't tear the building down so we had to look at it in a different way. Um, so just a couple of other things that influenced um, the design. One is the building is right across from the High Line. Um, and then there's a lot of metal and steel around there. There's, there's a Richard Serra sculpture in the center. And there's a railroad, um, a collapsing railroad uh, pier uh, not far from the site. And these are all the things that I sort of looked at when we started looking at the site. Um, in addition, um, you can see the site in uh, red uh, on the left, and then a diagram of the facade on the right. What's unique about this area of the city is that you have the New York grid, which a lot of people think of as just this rectilinear grill, grid, which crashes into uh, the village, which has all these haphazard streets, and then you get these interesting intersections that open up, and sort of the overlaying of those two grids is something that really um, informed the design, uh, which you'll see. Um, these are some of the early models, just studies we looked at. On the left was the first um, proposal by another team, which was just to extrude the building, which we knew was a non-starter. And then we started to look at, well, how could we break the building down so that we could set up um, a relationship between the existing building and the floors above? And then this idea of twisting as a way to kind of change the grid from this orthogonal grid to one that sort of responded to the different uh, directions of the streets and, and um, overlays of those two grids. Um, and then I have a, a little, um, not animation, but build up of the site. So that's the existing building. Um, and then the core, which is in brick, which you'll, I'll show you um, in another slide. Uh, then this is the entire FAR, five stories, full build, which we pulled in and we added a story. And then the idea of the twist where each building, each square sits, it gets consecutively smaller and sits within that. There's a little triangle that's left over that we uh, created a planting bed, um, which embraces this idea of this industrial language with the nature, which you see in the high line. The exoskeleton, which is a fireproof structure, which supports um, the building. Um, and then that's a rendering of the building that we had uh, originally. Um, just, I'll note a few things. Um, the brick, uh, we have two different color bricks on the original building, which we um, repointed with different color mortar to accentuate the different colors. Uh, all of the windows on the new building uh, match the same proportions of the windows on the lower section. And also those bands that you see that are created on the lower portion are reflected in two different brick patterns on the core, um, which you see, which you'll see. Here's a shot of the building uh, during construction. You can see the core um, on the upper, the upper section of, of that. And then the, um, the way this each floor, consecutive floor, sits on top of the, the one below it. Um, all of the um, uh, steel members were quote unquote off the shelf um, I-beams with the exception of the horizontals, which were actually built up because those are the only elements that the, the columns are actually straight, but the, the horizontal members are twisted um, to connect the, those two, um, or all each between two um, columns. Um, and here's a shot. As I said, those windows match the proportions of the windows below. And you can see on the right, there's two different there's bands of, of brick which relate to the, the brick below. Um, and. Um, this sort of, I, I like to show this one image on the lower right because you see the way the building twists away and when you're uh, north of that 
section, you actually don't even see the building, you just see the lower part. And then as you um, go down the street, the, the top sort of emerges from there. And this is my favorite shot, just from the high line with the plants and um, the building beyond. Um, and then this, this is another project in a historic district, Tribeca, um, which is south of Soho. A um, lot of large warehouses in this neighborhood um, and um, a lot of uh, cast iron and masonry. Um, and this is sort of like the exact opposite of everything I just said about not copying um, you know, style. Um, but there's a, a, a reason for that, which I'll um, try to explain. Um, the, the site is actually two um, building sites. One was an existing building, which you see uh, in the distance, and then um, a parking structure, which was deemed not to contribute to this historic district. Um, both sites were about 25 by 40 meters, um, pretty much the same, which I'll show you in a second. And then the building to the left is a building that we also um, had designed earlier. Um, when I started drawing the facade, which the building on the left was the building that we did, and then the sort of building with the big arches was my initial idea for the building, which was a bad copy of the building next door. And I kept thinking, why copy the building next door in a bad way? Why not copy it exactly as, as it was? And so that's what we did, um, which uh, we did in a different material because at first we were thinking of maybe doing it in another color brick, uh, but I thought that was too derivative and needed to create some kind of a relationship between the two buildings. Um, so we did it in aluminum uh, and a, a GFRC with a metal uh, resin uh, impregnated into that, which I'll, I'll show you some details now. But when I looked at the site, there were a couple of things that were happening in this district over time historically, which informed the process, as well as some of the materials there. So they would typically build with the current um, techniques. So some buildings may start off in stone, and then they added on in brick, and then eventually in plaster. And we saw a bunch of, say, four or five different examples of that. So the idea was to create sort of a similar approach where we had the existing building, which was stone, brick, and terracotta, and then this metal replica um, or mirror image of the building, um, which uh, recalled the use of cast iron in this district, which I'll show you. And another thing that really influenced the way I was thinking about the material is here's a, an image of the two lots, which I said were about 25 by 40 meters. Um, and it reminded me of a site in Japan, the Issei Shrine, which was renewed every 20 years. So they would take a piece of the wood shrine and rebuild it completely in its entirety um, on the adjacent site. And I was fortunate enough to see that. And in this um, example, you can see on the lower section, the brand new pristine shrine, and then the one that's 20 years old, built out of wood and starts to show its age. So I started thinking, well, can we do something that was like sort of this ideal version of the building that was existing? And so that's where I came up with the idea of using the metal um, facade. And the metal facade related to the cast iron architecture, which you saw throughout you know, New York, particularly in Soho, but also in Tribeca. These are two examples that are not masonry. These are cast iron facades that are, emulate masonry. And so we did a similar thing with the facade that we created. So here's the existing building on the right and the garage, which we demolished. Uh, on the left, um, and we did a scan of the building and recreated the entire building um, in um, a contrasting color in aluminum, which I'll show you, and this plasma treated um, uh, panel above. Here's a rendering of that um, building. And um, this is sort of give you a sense of the depth of the facade, which we recreated. Um, we restored all of the terracotta the brick on this uh, building. And then we redid um, all of those elements in, this is aluminum. You can see the girt system that supports that. That's on the lower section. Um, and then the uh, bricks, um, which were um, panelized um, on the upper sections. But we, we, we tried to emulate the, like on the 
left, you see the stone, the rib uh, quality from the stone and the surface texture uh, of the brick. Um, here's some of the panels going up on the building, um, but you can see the depth of the facades and the detail of the headers or the arches and the sills all were um, rendered as they were in the um, original building. Um, two views looking, one looking west and one looking um, east, showing the, the contrast between the two buildings, but also you see the depth of the facade, which I'm really happy with the way that worked out. Um, when we presented the, the project to the um, landmarks uh, committee of the community board, uh, the chair said, this reminds me of a Andy Warhol painting of Elvis Presley. And I was like, yeah, I guess so. Um, and, and we actually ended up becoming uh, close friends after that because we had a, a big discussion after it. But I really do feel like the real facade um, does capture that sort of metallic quality um, of this uh, Warhol piece. And you see this is a close-up detail of the facades. Um, on the right is the, the brick and, and terracotta with the metal facade on the left. Um, here's a project, um, this is a, one project outside of New York that I'm going to show in DC. Um, this uh, was on the site of a, a, a previous industrial um, plant um, and plumbing warehouse um, called Atlantic Plumbing. Um, and uh, we uh, we actually designed four buildings on these sites, each, which you can see on the axonometric on the right. Um, it was right next to this popular club, the 930 Club, um, uh, which you see on the left there. And then you see the signage for uh, the building. There were four buildings um, on the site. We reclaimed all the brick on the site and reused it uh, in the project, which I'll show you in a second. Um, there was a wall that people would stick their gum on while they were waiting in line to get their tickets for the concert, which we wanted to use in the project, but um, didn't work out. But uh, we did get to use all the bricks, um, which was great. Um, so I would go back and forth to um, DC from New York on the train, and I was fascinated by all of the industrial artifacts that were um, along the railroad tracks. Some were still in operation, but a lot of were abandoned. And in some cases, you'd start to see plants start to overtake uh, the buildings um, and the structures there. Um, and it also reminded me, like this one uh, very much so, reminded me of the work of Burned and Hiller Bescher, um, which I just saw at the museum uh, with Harlan today. Um, but uh, so I started thinking about industrial architecture on this uh, old industrial site and the X bracing, which is one thing that started to really resonate uh, for me, which you see on, in both of these structures, but also in a lot of their other um, photographs. And so that became a motif that we used on the site. Um, this entire structure actually works um, when we we got to the point where they got the budget back and they said, we, we really can't afford the, the, um, the core 10 structure, but how do you feel if we just do it in painted aluminum? And I was like, I don't, that doesn't really work. Um, it's really got to work. Or, and they gave me a whole explanation of why it was a post-tension building and they can't do the steel to help with the, the structure. And then we sat down with the contractor, the structural engineer, and figure out a way to actually make it do all the lateral loads. So we were able to eliminate some columns and some shear walls, and they were able to afford the, um, the structure. And so the, it's actually a real um, active part of the building. Um, so this is some of the other buildings. I think one of the things we tried to do with the patterns on the buildings overlaid both the brick pattern, which you see in the foreground, or the X bracing, was really to try and create another graphic language that broke down the scale of these very large buildings uh, that essentially had just all window wall um, that emulated the factory windows that you see um, in a lot of the buildings, um, both in, that were in this neighborhood and in the industrial landscape. Here's another shot. 
and this, this kind of gives you an idea of what those uh, windows look like and how they really work within the spaces as well as on the buildings themselves. Um, I had invited an artist who I had met to work um, on the project on the inside, um, Swedish artist Matthias Van Arkel. All of the elevator vestibules were open, had windows that you see here. And so he painted all of the um, elevator vestibules as well as the hallways with um, this graffiti treatment, um, and which was really great, which we hadn't really thought about when, we, when he was doing it, was the fact that it was going to you know, be illuminated and uh, resonate outside of the space. Um, but this is sort of the treatment. And then the last project I'm going to show you is a real, a real collaboration with him where his work is actually becoming the facade of a building, which I'll show you. Um, and as I said earlier, we took all of the bricks, which we reused throughout the building, um, but we tagged, numbered all of the sign, um, and you see the original sign on the top, the cataloging below, and then actually the, the uh, masons reassembling those um, bricks, which is um, the way we use them on the interior. Actually, um, all of the brick there was reclaimed from, from the project. Um, and uh, Chris designed that, these interiors. Um, and I'd mentioned the, 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 the idea that we wanted to overlay nature on the, on, on the sort of building, and uh, 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 we brought that into the inside of the building as well as um, you know, throughout the building and on the outside of the building um, as well. Um, and then, um, this is, I'm going to show you two brick buildings, both using um, Brickworks product. Um, and, um, they, but they did tell me I didn't have to talk about brick, but I, I, I love brick. So, um, and you can see, obviously. Um, so this is um, a building that really uses brick in a sort of modern way to replicate the historic quality of these buildings. And the next build, project I show you is going to be very different in the way that the brick is applied. Um, this um, is a historic building on the left, which looks like it's exploding. And that's actually what happened. Um, there was a gas explosion that uh, leveled three buildings on the site. And the project that we did um, uh, used two of those sites. Um, and as we as with all of these projects, we start by looking at the neighborhood, looking at the context, doing research. Um, the, the drawing on the left, the plan with the star shows the site, but that's the uh, Lower East Side, uh, East Village um, Historic District. And these are the typical tenement buildings that you see throughout the district. So we looked at those buildings in terms of how they were organized, the facades, groupings of windows, as well as the way the, ba the buildings were very typical, um, or organized very typically with a base, uh, with a lot of leaded glass and uh, storefronts, a midsection, and then a very strong uh, cornice or top floor. Um, and so we, that's essentially what we did. We started by taking our brick, which we wanted to do something that was a little less yellow, a little grayer, but still warm. And we took the brick on a tour uh, to all of the other buildings in the neighborhood to kind of make sure that we, we captured the warmth of um, the neighborhood, but something that we felt was a little cleaner um, and more uh, modern. And that's Glengarry, which is a Brickworks um, company. Um, and so um, here's a, an image of the facade. Um, you can see the base with the leaded glass storefronts um, at the bottom, this midsection, and then the top. Um, and then this is the, that was the second uh, avenue, and this is 7th Street, again, with the windows grouped together, you know, to form these uh, three um, triple uh, uh, bays um, uh, on the facade. Um, and then this is sort of a summary of the different treatments. We used um, a single corbel brick at the base, uh, this checkerboard, which was actually a custom brick uh, that we, we, made, we had made for this project. Um, and then a double corbeling at the roof. The cornice actually looks like a bracketed cornice, which you see in the neighborhood, but actually has 
metal mesh in between the brackets. That's a parapet wall. So it's kind of a reinterpretation of the, of, of the cornice uh, in a way that worked uh, with the top floor as well. And um, sort of you, get, you see the original rendering and then the actual building. Um, I'm always happier when the building looks better than the rendering. Um, and the center section, uh, the base um, with the, both the ribbed and the checkerboard uh, brick. Uh, and then there's a view of the building um, as it was finished. Um, and then I also like the way that the very modern, clean windows work with the recess and the heavily patterned um, facade. Um, and so this is the other project that I mentioned. This is in a special district, but was not subject to any approvals, with the exception of that we had to conform to uh, massing and zoning um, as outlined uh, for the special district. Um, and this was a, a very different read. We call this context as content because really used the existing building and drew literally from that and on the building, um, which you'll see now. Again, these are the tenement buildings that are pretty typical in the neighborhood with very um, strong articulation around the windows, the heads, and trim around the building. And these are the things that we tried to capture um, and draw on the facade. Um, again, another example of that. Um, so the idea was to come up with a pattern that replicated what a typical tenement building would look like on the facade and then overlay our building, our new building, with its regular window pattern um, across that facade. Um, we started by looking at different ways that we could do that, rendered in different types of stone, maybe uh, bush hammered or honed, um, and then having this outline of this previous invented facade um, overlay there. And we started with this idea. Then we looked at sort of a pixelization where we could have, you know, you know solid and open pixels to um, create those patterns. And as you probably guessed, um, we decided to do it in brick. Um, and so also, again, we did a, a custom brick for this. Um, and this was a really um, satisfying um, project because we were able to envision something and then have it realized um, the, exactly the way that we thought it was going to be. And actually, in some ways, even better. Um, so here's a, a render of that facade. One of the facades, this is Grand Street. Oh, sorry. This is Mulberry. And um, you see the patterns uh, starting to take shape there. Um, and then um, these are the bricks that we used. The basic brick was a double brick, um, was one brick with a, a, a false joint. And then we have um, many different um, permutations of that brick um, in order to create all the shapes. But typically, it was the double dome brick or a single dome brick on one of those. Um, these are just, not just, these are drawings of the different bricks. We had a, a square or rectilinear one as well as a curved because we have a curved section. You have the single at the bottom and the double um, above it and then the face bricks above that. Um, and then here's an image of the building. Um, and I think what's really great is how the shadow helps to, the shadows really help to accentuate the facade and create the sense of depth that you see between the facade and the, um, the windows. Um, and then this is uh, Grand Street, similar drawing, uh, the render, and then the reality. They're finishing up now. This is, these were taken a couple of weeks ago, but. Um, that's all coming off. Um, and here are the guys. Um, what was really uh, satisfying is how excited the Masons were to do this project. It wasn't just like another job. And they literally had to follow drawings of where all these special bricks um, were on the facade. Um, and every time I go to the site, they were really excited uh, to talk about how, the, you know, how they were doing it. Um, here's another shot of that. And then this is that ground column. And this is the last project I want to talk about. Um, 
This was a co collaboration with uh, my office with Matthias Van Arkel, um, Swedish artist. Um, and I think this has been like the perfect um, roadmap of how we started working with someone who was an artist that did some applied painting on a building to where his work is actually being incorporated um, into the architecture. Um, this building is in Soho, or right on the edge of Soho. Um, we're gonna restore a federal building on the right, all the way on the right, and then the new building is going where those two buildings are, or actually three buildings on the corner. Um, and Soho, as I, as I mentioned earlier, was made up of cast iron buildings. Here are some uh, examples of those cast iron buildings. Uh, another thing that was um, important about Soho was that it was really saved by the artists who, who went there in the 70s, people like Donald Judd, um, uh, Jasper Johns, and Rauschenberg. The building on the right is actually the Judd House. Um, and there are a couple things that are interesting. Actually, that was his studio and um, his living space. Um, but I think another thing that's really unique or novel, and I haven't found many buildings like this, but the other cast iron buildings typically emulated the classical orders and, you know, would, would riff on those in a certain way, but typically had uh, solid uh, or heavier columns on the base, usually starting with the Tuscan or the Doric and then working up to more, um, you know, finer, thinner Corinthian or composite orders on top. Um, the 101 spring, the Judd House, is, is the opposite. It starts off with these very thin columns at the base and they get heavier and heavier as they go up because they wanted to focus on the retail space on the bottom and make those columns as, as thin as possible. And that's something that we looked at uh, for this project. And then here are just some other examples of masonry or cast iron, heavily decorative, rusticated um, uh, elements that you can see like on the upper left. Um, so here's some other work of Matthias's. He started off as a painter, and then he sort of shifted to becoming a sculptor, but really he says he still makes paintings um, out of silicone. Um, and you can see like the one, that installation in the pool, very large scale works. They're very deep, um, and he, he models the um, silicone and then, and then bakes it um, to, to harden it. And our initial idea was actually to use silicone but there were a lot of issues with fireproofing, um, or and actually it has a higher melting point than metal, um, but we still couldn't get the, the city to agree to allow us to use it. Um, and I showed you this um, earlier, but um, I just wanted to remind you that this was Matthias. Um, on the left, this that's a rusticated um, uh, masonry unit uh, with vermiculation. Um, on the right is a mock-up of what we're that is not the exact pattern yet, but that's a mock-up of what we're doing. So Matthias just finished um, his piece, which we scanned um, in 3D, obviously, and uh, we're going to make the whole facade in zinc. And so just as the cast iron was used uh, to emulate uh, masonry, we're gonna do that with the cast um, zinc. Um, and again, we started with the thin elements at the base of the building, and those went up on the two um, principal facades. Um, demolition just started on the, those existing buildings, and construction should start soon. Here's a render of that building. Um, and I think the one thing you don't really sense here is how, how deep the facade is gonna be with, uh, with those um, castings. Um, another couple of shots. Uh, of the facade and the detail, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, this is the book published by Images. I think it's pretty much sold out. I was going to have a lot of books here, but we couldn't get any here. But what we did do, though, is if you go to ma.com slash book, or you can find it another way, you can read the book or get a copy online. Thank you.
Should we get the chair? Hello. Hello, Morris. Welcome to Australia. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, it was great to um, hear your interpretation of what historic context is and how you apply your thinking to that. Thank you. A broad question to start with. Let's go back to your beginning. From New Orleans to Aldo Rossi. How did you, that transition affect um, your architectural thinking and how does that affect your architectural thinking now? You discussed it in, in, as an introduction, but I'm wondering about how that is now influencing what you do now or how it's evolved. Um, well, I think it's definitely evolved. Um, I was attracted to all those work because he was able to look at history in a different way to maintain uh, an identity of modern architecture, but also connect it to historical types. And that was something that interested me, the idea of typologies. And um, I think that I'm still interested in this idea that new architecture can be informed by history, but maybe less so about specific types mm -hmm. and that like strict reading of those um, buildings. Yeah, because the modern context is quite different, as you pointed out right. in, in, in the projects. The first case study you showed, the Samsung building, was one some of us saw on the recent Brickworks New York architecture study tour. You described how it was adjacent to the developments along the High Line. Did you find that, had, that you had more flexibility in designing your building due to that uh, context? Um, I'd say a little bit. I mm -hmm. would say that, first of all, this was in a historic district, so it was you know, regulated by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Um, the fact and are, that it, are there different regulations on the High Line? Um, yeah, it depends yeah. on where it is. I yeah. mean, the High Line connects a couple of different neighborhoods, yep. like all the way from like Penn Station through Chelsea, then down to Meatpacking or um, Gansville Market District. Um, I think that the High Line has really spawned a tremendous amount of new architecture and a different way of seeing the city from an elevated point of view. Um, a lot of the city actually was accessed by the elevated uh, subway system, and there are remnants of this you see throughout the city. Yeah. You might see an entrance to a building at the second floor. That's because you entered from the, the subway platform mm. on the second floor. Um, but I think you know, the, the influence of the High Line on the building is mm. clear because of the structure. Um, but we had to make a different sort of case or narrative of what we were doing for mm. them. You had to uh, argue the case differently, yes. yes. Yeah. So as a follow-up, do you think the High Line developments have affected the opportunities for contemporary architecture elsewhere in Manhattan? I mean, it's certainly put a focus on name brand architects, I think. <laughs> not me, not me, but, you know, other architects. Um, yeah, the, you know. And, and do you think it's only that? It's not a broader appreciation of... Of architecture, I mean, I, I wonder. No, no, I think absolutely. I yeah. think it's both. I think it's both. It's both. Yeah. 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 So there's a, a better understanding of what contemporary architecture can do, perhaps. Yeah, and I think it's very present on the High Line, mm. and it's you know a lot of the sites are you know strategically located along the High Line. Mm. We we actually did two buildings on uh, two other buildings on the High Line, um, and it's interesting to see the perception of those buildings from a tall, higher vantage point. Mm. It's a different perspective on things. Yeah, yeah. I liked your Issei Shrine reference. Okay, thanks. Um, following on from, from that, some of, some of your other projects appear to be more constrained by their context, and you did describe some of that. Um, I, I assume there's a desire by the authorities to conform to a more rigid <laughs> Um, heritage context and also to kind of fit with those lower Manhattan warehouse office block typologies. You discussed some of that approach, um, but just so we can be able to compare, how complex is the planning process in New York and how stringent are the historic overlays you've had to work within to have to create the buildings you've created? We, we've had a tremendous history or 
uh, uh, number of buildings approved in the Landmarks District, mm -hmm. over, over 40. Um, so we have dealt with uh, different um, agencies, um, community boards, neighborhood groups, um, Landmarks Preservation Commission, elected officials, and I've always said that the only way that you're going to get through the process, because most of the people that call up are dreading going through it, is to embrace the process. And a lot of times, it makes the project better. Mm. It's always painful because yeah. you've got a tremendous amount of people that are trying to influence the outcome. Um, but um, I think it, it's, it's actually not the worst place I've ever worked to get <laughs> buildings approved. Um, we're doing a project in the Bay Area in East Palo Alto, and uh, we'd been working on the project for two years, and we presented to the community board the first time. And our client, at the end, was summing up everything and said, we're looking forward to the next two years of working through this with you. And I was like, two more years of this? <laughs> And they told us it was going to take 10 years to get the project approved. I thought they were joking, you know, at the beginning. But just all of the, you know, California has a tremendous number of regulations. And mm. this is on a brownfield site. And there's a, a, a waterway next door. And it, it's just very complicated. So New York starts to look, you know, almost easy. easy. But it's not. It's not. It's, it's not, not, not. It's not. And obviously, you've, you've um, developed techniques and, and strategies and probably have people you're working with in that regard, but still every project would come with its different parameters and you'd have to tackle each one differently. Yeah. How, how do you feel about that? And do you have mountains of patience? I'm not a patient person, but <laughs> when it comes to those mm. projects, I, you need to be patient. Yes. But I think it's really just about building a story or a narrative. And you know, as, as, as I mentioned, it's really, trying to understand the place, the context, the history, and then try and take that information and to create a credible explanation of why the design is the way it is. And I think it makes the project better. And I think we try to do that even if we don't have a, some agency or board that we have to approve the project. But just to kind of make, to give the project meaning, I think you really have to understand the place. I mean, that ties back to your roots with Rossi and that, that telling that story, but you're also taking the people you're presenting to on a journey and yes. trying to Im include them in that process in, in that way, which not everybody does. Yeah. Um, for instance, I wonder how many other planning officials might make an Andy Warhol artwork reference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fantastic story. Yeah. And um, it's funny because I got to be very friendly with this um, this person and um, he completely shredded a previous project, the project that was next door to that when we presented it. And we ended up getting the project approved. And he admitted to me afterwards that he liked the building, but we got <laughs> annihilated when we first presented the project. And then that's when we started to become okay. friends. And, and have you um, acquired a number of developers that like working with you as a, as a consequence, or you just have become yeah. known for getting things through? Well, I think, yeah, we, I think we have a reputation of being able to get things through, but I always tell everybody in the office that it's a lot easier to get another project from our clients than it is to get a new client. And yes. so a lot of our projects, um, or not a lot of our, a lot of our clients, we do, multi we do multiple projects with them. So I can name, you know, half a dozen clients that we've done multiple projects for. Mm. And, That's a good uh, sign. Yeah. We yeah. Keep them happy and they come back. Yeah, good. That, good, good. Yeah. That's my takeaway. <laughs> for Graham Mulberry, however, you've been able to explore a more interpretive, artistic response to the context. You've also explored contemporary brick fabrication processes. So I've got two questions. I'll ask them one at a time. Okay. Would you like to elaborate on how you worked within the planning parameters and how this was received by the authorities? So, first of all, I want to back up for one second. Yeah, different say, planning here. No, 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 no. That was the third project for that developer. Okay. So, that's an example. That's a good start. We did uh, the other project that I showed before that 
on uh, 7th and 2nd Avenue. It was the same client, and we did another project uh, for him. Um, and so I think there was a certain amount of trust after we, the other projects had to go through an approval process, whereas this one didn't. And so, so there are still pockets in New York where you don't necessarily have to go through a full planning process. Well, you have to go through the building department, but not necessarily the design has mm -hmm. to be approved. Nice to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But that actually had a curious story. We didn't have to actually go through any boards, but there was um, the Italian American Museum was in a building on the site. And so they sold the site to the developer, mm -hmm. but they were going to get a space in the building. I noticed that on so, the renders. So there's an entrance on um, Mulberry, and then they have some space on the ground floor, and then they have two floors below for the museum. So they had to approve the building because uh -huh. they were going in. Um, so that was part of the approval uh, was process. That, was yeah. that more difficult? No, no, they actually was loved okay. the building. Yeah, yeah, so it was good. It oh, was good. good. Good to hear. Yeah. The second part of the question was, how interesting, challenging, or fun was it to explore the technology of bricks? I love bricks. I, yeah. So I, my dream is to design a brick that um, is going to extract all the most toxic materials into the bricks. And we did use a brick that recycled um, batteries um, as part of a lead platinum building that we did okay. uh, for NYU. Um, but I want to work with Brickworks to create something that takes plastic and all kind of other mm. really nasty materials, and we can build buildings out of them instead of putting it in the, you know, landfill. Fantastic! So, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. People at Brickworks would right. like to have a chat. But but also <laughs> but also I want to design a brick that gives that so like some of the buildings like we corb all the bricks or we use um, the special shapes, but to have a brick that um, is coordinated both with the um, mortar and the colors, as well as um, create a size that allows you to do more um, with the dimensions in terms of how the building, how the brick can project from the building mm. or how they can stack up to create other patterns. Mm. So. You have certain regulations about protrusions and things in New York, and some of them are quite large. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think you can get, I mean, some of those existing cornices project like three or four or five feet out. Mm -hmm. Now you can project about a foot and a half. Um, and so we've tried to use other techniques to make those cornices or projections more graphic. Mm. And you talked about the cornice on the last one having mesh behind it. So yeah. I assume there's a balcony behind there. And yeah, there's a whole roof deck. A whole yeah. roof deck, yeah. 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 Um, and you did talk about all of these buildings trying to create them within this historic context, but using new materials or contemporary materials. And, and windows were part of that. So you had a lot of very large windows that um, bring a lot of light into, into the buildings, but is there opportunity for, for ventilation, fresh air? Yeah, I'm a big believer in fresh air. Um, I think it, it also is affected by some of the um, uh, lead considerations or well considerations mm. that mm. we're working with. But I like to see operable windows. So even those very large, you know, single pane windows are usually tilt and turn. So yep. they tilt in, so you can open. or they can turn, and you can clean them um, from from there. But even the factory windows all have operable panel panels. Just as a slight aside, we have a regulation where you can't open such windows more than 100 millimeters. Do you have a similar? Yeah. Yeah. The same same deal. So people don't fall out. Yeah. <laughs> Except like on some projects, we'll try to do a like a Juliet balcony yep. where we'll have a, a glass or a mesh rail mm. and then you can open those windows or a balcony. And what about those famous external fire escapes? Do you still try to do any of those or they're no longer a thing? They, they're no longer a thing because it's hard to get them to count as uh, yeah. you know, legal. Yeah. Um, so if they exist, they exist. They exist. Yeah. 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 So the Mulberry, Grand Mulberry Project, has that now open the way for you to explore alternative thinking on other projects? Yeah, in terms of the materials or? Yeah, for instance, the final project. Yeah. You know, the, oh, the, fi the final one. Yeah, yeah. well, as an example, but yeah. you know, following on from Grand Mulberry where yeah. you did explore imprinting a different 
facade onto yeah. a new facade. Yeah, I mean, we're always trying to look at new mm. materials. We've done zinc. Uh, we used a, like a, 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 a triangular um, zinc panel as a skin for a building. Mm. Uh, we did um, a custom zinc um, a fold for a facade. Uh, the, Matthias's building is going to be probably the most sort of inventive facade just because it's actually um, probably um, like two centimeters deep. Like, so so you get a lot is of, it folded zinc or is it poured? That's cast. It's cast. Cast. Yeah. Yes, and it's thick. Okay. Yeah, and heavy. Yes. <laughs> but still fits within budgets, obviously. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Um, yeah, I suppose I was asking Unfortunately, because... Unfortunately, I only had one project where we didn't have to, but all the new ones have to be budgets. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was one, one amazing project yeah. in Japan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, yeah it was great. Yeah, but as you said, it did, that building did set up a whole district yeah. that was designed by various architects yeah. from around the world. And I think it really changed that. And Fukuoka just that implemented put that a, place a on new the map. design. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, the yeah design yeah. Got, uh, uh, awards and mm. guidelines, yeah. I mean, I suppose part of what I was getting at was have those earlier projects given you courage and or credibility to propose these kind of alternatives or a bit of both? Yeah, I mean, like when we did the first, uh, not the first, but when we did the uh, Sterling Mason, we had no idea how we were going to um, make that facade. And mm. we presented it and it was approved. And then we had to figure out like how we were going to do it. Yeah. And like the metal... Um, the aluminum is, is, has like a plasma finish, um, which they use for propellers um, because it's, uh, they resist heat and uh, friction. Um, but yeah, that was a spray on finish on the aluminum um, that was uh, well raked and worked first and then the finish was applied. Okay. You kind of touched on it, but how different has it been for you to work outside of New York? I mean, apart from Palo Alto, you must have had quite different experiences in different parts of the U.S. and elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, the, f f it, 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 the funny thing is a lot of times we'll get a call from somebody out of town. They say, can you do a building like this for us? And we're like, well, that building makes sense in that space. And so we need to look at the place and then we try to bring our sensibility and the research and the design um, to the place. And so it's been interesting in that got to see get to see a lot of different um, cities and get to respond. Like we were doing a couple of projects in Miami and they, well, I was presenting to one of the um, design review committees and they said, we'd like to see something more like um, meatpacking in New York. I'm like, that is absolutely the last thing you need in Miami. It's a <laughs> completely different climate, completely different um, history. Yeah. Um, and I was like, that is not, you know, you're talking about industrial, but that's a specific, you know, place and it has a specific um, sort of, you know, language that's very foreign to Miami. And we've done projects that draw on Deco or other work um, in, in other markets. Yeah, so. yeah. Any more unusual things? Nothing yet. Coming? Coming. Uh, yeah, we do. We have some unusual things coming in Miami. Well, we'll yeah. keep, keep an yeah. eye out. Yeah. Different line of questioning. I've always found inspiration in the creative creativity of other disciplines, art, theatre, music. And you brought up your Brian Eno reference, very well explained, very interesting. Um, would you like to add to that or elaborate on that or discuss the idea of being influenced by other creative processes? Absolutely. I, you know, I, I think, you know, I look at architecture, obviously, um, but I think that having art in our office has made a big difference. And so when we moved about 10 years ago to our new space, um, we started with an exhibition of Aldo Rossi drawings. I have a collection of drawings. And that sort of was the foundation for the office and also sort of the metaphorical beginning of this new space I thought should have that um, uh, story told or retold. Um, and so we've had a series of exhibitions in the office which allow us to do what we're doing tonight, which is invite people in. Um, we connected our developer clients with our artists. Matthias sold a big, a very large piece to one of our clients and they put it in the lobby. 
And so like that is sort of like the perfect example of something that started off as a, you know, uh, an application inside a building and then a piece of work was put in the building and now we're building the facade. Um, so I think the art has always been mm -hmm. um, a thread that runs through our projects. But I think it also keeps our office fresh and it keeps our office um, hopefully thinking about the ways different um, disciplines can inform what we do. Absolutely, yeah, because we can inspire and be inspired by all of the creative processes. Absolutely. Yeah, as we're going to do when we go to the Opera House. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, can you give us some insights into how your practice is structured and how you collaborate within the practice and with your clients? With such a large studio, it'd yeah, be interesting to I, hear. I never ever envisioned having an office. I worked with Aldo. I think the biggest his office was was maybe about 25 people. Um, and then we had about another, I think, 12 in, in New York at the time. Um, but it just kept growing, just at, not on its own, um, as a result of we needed more people to, to, to service the clients. Um, but I think that our office is still a very studio-based, collaborative office. Um, one thing I changed um, around uh, recently, um, and Harlan, who's here, was part of some of those changes, and we've just sort of ex extended that, where we have uh, design uh, on two days, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and have another day on Wednesday with New Orleans, but where we actually bring everybody together around a table, and we bring projects, and we review the projects, almost like a crit session in school. And that's been really well received, and it's been a way that we can bring design to more people instead of just being in a room with two people looking at, at, at a project. And so we'll like sometimes have you know, 10 or 12 people around a table. And I think that collaborative um, approach in, you know, improves also the project. You yeah. know? And it, 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 it helps to mentor the young staff and also get a more um, diverse um, you know, group of people looking at things. Yeah, you throw ideas around, but it's not always easy to manage, you know, so is it the people only working on those projects or do other people get to no, join in? It, or it's, it's, it's a mix. It's, it's about One of the things that we have been wrestling with from the beginning is, and we brought interior, you know, we created this interior studio because it wasn't satisfying working with other offices because sometimes you'd walk through the front doors and you'd look at the interiors and you're like, well, is it, what, what, am I in the same building? You know, like, what is it? Mm. And so, but it, it sort of started to grow apart. And I, you know, so now all the design sessions that we have for a project have the interiors group and the architects all at the table, even if we're not talking about interiors, but yeah. we maybe, we end up talking about it because how because do you get the influence building? each other? That's yeah, fantastic. Yeah, it's like, yeah. how, does, how, does, how does our impression of, you know, the entrance, you know, work and how do we really, you know, navigate through the building and how does architecture and interior work together. And that's mm -hmm. why we added this art services where we could actually then populate the buildings with art, not our art, but, you know. Well, tell us a little more about those art services. You touched on that big neon billboard yep. artwork. Um, how have you structured that? How does that work? And how have you been able to succeed in that realm? It started off as the exhibition program, which we had one, essentially one a quarter. So we had four shows a year. Um, and, you know, I would get, I know artists or some, I found some on Instagram, invited them and they came. We did an exhibition of forgeries. There was a studio in um, California that used copying, you know, masterworks as a way to learn how to paint. So we had um, six Mona Lisas in our uh, elevated vestibule <laughs> and then a whole range of other works that they you know that they um, uh, sent um, and then we had a big party for them the drinks were all forgeries we had uh, a little um, beer a little pony beer um, that was sparkling wine and we had a, a mixed drinks in coke bottles and coffee urn just you know used to um, uh, I think we had black Russians in there. So, mm -hmm. so we tried to make the, the when we did a Matias show. And we did Aldo Jello. Rossi coffee pots? Uh, we did have Aldo <laughs> Rossi coffee. No, no, not for that show. Um, what did we do for Aldo's show? 
Oh, we did Negronis. Um, mm -hmm. And then we did uh, Jello shots from Matthias's show, but they were like little baby versions of his sculptures, uh -huh. you know, with the colors. Yeah, fantastic. Through. So, Very good. Yeah. So. Yeah, but that's, that's what you did in house. Yeah. How, oh, so, how are you so, affecting projects so elsewhere? It, start, yeah. it started. <laughs> yeah. Not as a no, conversation. No, no. It's a it's, conversation. It's, it's okay. it, st it started with the program. Um, with the woman who bought one of Matthias's pieces. She mm -hmm. sat down in the conference room and there was one of his pieces there and we were, said, we could give you some suggestions. She goes, why can't I get one of those? We're like, okay, talk to Matthias. So yeah. he, and then another, the, the guy who actually heads up the program now is a friend of mine, he's a painter. And we did a show of his work and he had 45 watercolors um, on the wall. One of our clients came in and said, how much are those? And we said, well, they're whatever, a thousand each, or if you buy three, it's whatever. He goes, what if I buy the whole wall? <laughs> I'm like, what? And there's 45 pieces. He goes, I want them all. I said, talk to the artist. And so then from that, we started saying, okay, well, this, this could be a thing. And so we this started- This is one of those things when people say only in New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. So, but he, he, he sold 45 pieces. It's the most work Fantastic. he ever sold in his yeah. life. Um, but, um, yeah, and so we finished a two large uh, residential buildings and we pitched the idea that we would select the art. And so we did that um, for two projects and we're doing, we did the sign, we did a sculpture. Um, and so we just, we're, we try to offer that service to every project now. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're well, successful good. and sometimes good. not. Yeah. yeah, we've got a little bit more time, but just... Okay. Following on from this idea of how, how the office works, you didn't get into all the detail, and you don't have to if you don't wish to, but how do you see, you know, do you have partners? How do you work with them? Do you have a succession plan? How do you see yourself moving forward? And, th and this is for you up the back, wherever he is. <laughs> yeah, I'm figuring that out now. Um, I don't have partners, um, but I think I need partners. Mm. And so I've... I started working on a succession plan, I'm getting really in the weeds here, but I started working on a succession plan right before COVID and sort of pulled the plug when COVID hit. And then um, just recently, about three months ago, reached back out to um, the company. It was a, it's a, a law firm who helps with these types of things um, to figure out what the next steps were. And um, we had actually done a lot of the things that we were supposed to do. Like we had changed the... Um, corporation so that we could allow people to buy in. Um, we trademarked the name um, and done a couple other things that he had suggested that we do. So we're kind of ready. And so now, and then I talked to some companies about buying um, the firm and decided that it was better to bring people in that were mm. already in the company or people from outside the company. Mm. And so I kind of have a structure now and it's a matter of um, implementing that. So yeah. I'm trying to do that by the end of the year to start the offering and then try to realize it shortly mm. after that. Thank you for being quite open with your answers. Um, I think that's a good point to end on. Thank you once again for showing us all your projects and, and enlightening us on your thinking behind those projects. Um, and being our first live international speaker for three years. So please... Well, Thank Morris. Thank you. I want to thank you. I'm really incredibly happy to be here and to see the country. And I spent yesterday and today running around Sydney, which has been amazing. Um, thank Brickworks. Thank the AV team. They did an amazing job. Um, and. Um, if any of you happen to be in New York, please ring me up. <laughs> Open invitation. <laughs> Especially if you want to work. And if you want to work, e even yeah, more so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maurice Ajmi and Stephen Barrity, for an interesting and informative discussion this evening. We appreciate the time and effort that goes into preparing for events like this and hope everyone has enjoyed watching as much as we've enjoyed putting it together. 
To see more events like this, to request a CPD presentation or one of our publications, head to our website, brickworks.com.au to subscribe. We have many more exciting events coming up and we hope you can join us. Thank you and we'll see you next time.